gets it. This is your chance for your opening. So good luck. Floor is yours. All right, cool. I'm going to start a timer. All right. There was a lot there. But um, for one, I want to see if we're going to keep the same energy of Occam's razor, which is that which requires the least amount of assumptions. Uh, that, of course, is terrible for the globe model. But um, one thing I want to cover real quick that can just end this whole entire discussion uh, it actually overlaps with the gravity thing. He said gravity is mass attracting mass, which is objectively not the case anymore. Uh, it can't be the case. The Earth quite literally cannot be a ball that orbits the sun with mass attracting mass. Newtonian mechanics can't exist. And I'm sure we'll get into that. And I don't know why people keep invoking it. But one thing I want to point out that I think is an easy way to kind of go ahead and end the conversation is we have uh, an electric field on the earth, okay? So we have a uniform electric field. It's vertical on the earth, and it's it, you can measure the electric field, right? It has equipotential lines. They It's 100 volts per meter, meaning there's an equal increase of potential every 100 or every meter. It's 100 volts, right? So there's equipotential lines within a vertical electric field on the earth, and it's uniform. Okay, this is physically impossible on a sphere. You can take a conductive sphere and put it in an electric field, and because the charge is distributed radially, it will not be uniform. This is a, a fact. You cannot have a uniform electric field on a sphere. So the very electric field we observe on the Earth proves that the Earth is, in fact, not a sphere, because, again, there will be spherical radial distribution of charge. What you would have is concentric circles serving as your G or equipotential surfaces or lines, and then you would not have a uniform electric field. Now, just to read Feynman here to explain it, another thing that can be measured in addition to the potential gradient that we just discussed is the current in the atmosphere. The current density is small, about 10 micro micro amps crosses each square meter parallel to the earth. The air is evidently not a perfect insulator, and because of this conductivity, a small current caused by the electric field we have just been describing, passes from the sky down to the earth. Okay, and you can measure it. You can run a generator off of it, actually. Now, the question would be, if there's, a, if there's constantly a downward electric current on the earth, would that create a downward bias? Would downward electric pressure be caused by the downward electric current? The answer is, of course, yes. Yes, we would have a downward bias because there's always a downward electric current. To get more specific, although the electric current density in the air is only a few micro micro amps per square meter, there are very many square meters on the Earth's surface. The total electric current reaching the Earth's surface at any time is very nearly constant at 1800 amps. This current, of course, is quote unquote positive. It carries a plus charge to the Earth. We have a voltage supply of 400,000 volts with a current of 1800 amps, a power of 700 megawatts at any given time. Now, that's assuming the size of the Earth. It's actually greater than that. Um, so to kind of break this down, I hope everyone's following. People refer to the fact that things fall as gravity. That is allegedly the effect of gravity. That is little g. It is 9.8 meters per second squared. That is not gravity, as in the cause of things going down. It is things going down. You can actually solve for that with kinematic equation. You can actually uh, solve for that using Coulomb's law. There's an equivalence that has been proven in the electromagnetic nature of gravity, a paper written by Constantine Mice, who sat on the board of Nuclear Physics Institute, right? That you can actually have an equivalence with, with electrostatics. Now, important to note, everything does not fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. That is a misnomer. We People are taught everything falls at the same rate and mass attracts mass. It's a very simple layman way to explain things to people when they're younger in school. The reality is things fall at different rates. What a coincidence that the electric field creating the electric current is very nearly constant, just like the rate at which things fall. So that right there explains things falling on the earth and why there's a downward bias, why it's nearly constant, but it fluctuates. Gravimeters have proven that things fall at different rates during thunderstorms and mass and quote unquote gravity have been excluded as a possible explanation. I have all of these papers. I'll drop them as they're requested. In addition, in order, so that gets rid of the spherical claim. You cannot have a uniform vertical electric field with, uh, on a, with equipotential surfaces on a sphere. That's physically possible. 
uh, that gives you the downward electric bias that's measurable, showing things fall and change at which rate they fall based on that objectively. So now you're going to have to claim there's something additional there that you can't verify, but we can actually verify our position based on empirical evidence. Let's use Occam's razor. Remember that which requires the least amount of assumptions. So we're just going to go with the actual evidence. And also in order to have a vertical electric fill with equipotential lines, you actually are going to have to have what's called a Gaussian surface. And to quickly explain that, and we can get into it, in Gauss's law, you have what's called Gaussian surfaces, and typically they're used as mathematical or hypothetical constructs. But when you're making a physical demonstration of, a, say, a, a uniform electric field, you're going to need real physical plates to serve as those surfaces, right? And they have to be parallel to each other, and they have to be perpendicular to the field. Well, on the Earth, we have a vertical electric field. So what is perpendicular to vertical? It is, of course, horizontal. So in order to have the actual equipotential electric field we have, there has to be some type of containment above us. It has to be parallel to the surface, and it has to actually be horizontal. And this is just facts. So that argument right there, that fact alone, gets rid of the spherical geometry claim. It gets rid of the quote-unquote gravity claim, and it gets rid of the we live in uh, a ball, I live on a ball in a vacuum claim. Okay, that's six minutes, and we can get into that. And again, this is uh, Feynman Lectures. It's uh, 9.1, I believe, and it's about atmospheric electricity. You can check it. You can check the measurements yourself. You can go out and verify yourself, and you can run um, generators off of it. So for the last few minutes, what I'm going to do is cover a couple things that he said. Retrograde motion is not exclusive to the Earth orbiting the sun. In fact, in order to think that it was, you would have to not believe in the current model, which uses relativity and actually says there's a kinematic equi equivalence between a geocentric stationary position and a heliocentric model, meaning all planetary motion, all geometric patterns are equivalent in both models. They're equally valid. Einstein will tell you this point blank in all of his papers. He said it. So there's kinematics, how bodies move in relation to each other. And there's dynamics, which is the supposed force that causes them to move that way. Okay. Gravity would be the claim dynamics. And then kinematics is just how they move. Retrograde would be a kinematic observation, right? The planets look like they go backwards. Now, of course, on a stationary Earth, there are multiple explanations, one of which is we measure the planets in relation to the background stars. So if the planets were to actually just slow down, on occasion, they would look from our perspective to be going backwards in relation to the background stars. There's a much more popular one that's been known about for a long time, which comes from the Tychonic system. That's Tycho Brahe, which is where Kepler and everyone even got their data in the first place, right? And Tycho Brahe, or a Neo-Tychonic system, would say that the planets move around the sun as that entire system moves around the Earth. Then you would have the exact same explanation that a heliocentric model has, which is it looks like they're going backwards because they're moving in relation to the sun, right? And then you have internal planets, et cetera. So there's a kinematic equivalence with retrograde that isn't exclusive to the Earth, um, flying around the sun whatsoever. And in fact, the Mercury's perihelion shift shows you that their model doesn't even work. Gravity doesn't even work. And it still hasn't been explained to this day. Okay. And we'll get more into this stuff, hopefully. But lunar eclipses, he said that the only shape that can have that is a sphere. You can, of course, put anything in front of something that's taking some type of spherical shape, which could be plasma. If you look at light from a distance, it looks like a sphere, right? It has a radius of light. So any light source from a distance is going to look like a sphere because it has a radius of light, right? Illumination. Same with the planets and everything. But that aside, you could take uh, a cylinder and move it in front of the moon and it would create a circular shadow. This has been replicated many times. If you've never heard of it, it may sound unfamiliar to you, but it is a fact. You can take any shape and move it in front of it and cause the circular shadow. And actually lunar eclipses debunk the globe as we have selenillion eclipses where the sun and the moon are both above the earth during the eclipse, when supposedly the Earth is blocking the light from the sun, casting a shadow onto the moon, which is a geometric impossibility. This is another time where we'll throw Occam's razor out, I'm sure, because Occam's razor is the globe's worst enemy. North Star cannot be seen from super far south. That's correct, because you can't see forever on a flat Earth. And whenever all these things were called predictions from the globe, they're actually just, we looked at the sky, we recorded it over hundreds or even thousands of years, and then we crafted a globe Earth model based on the celestial observations. That's quite literally how we made it. So that would be the opposite of prediction. That would quite literally be the opposite. So if you say, hey, look, I'm going to look at all the sky and then make up a model in my head of the Earth being a globe, then I'm going to say, hey, look, the globe predicts what happens in the sky that is hilariously backwards. That's awesome. I still got a couple minutes. So that is post-diction, not prediction. 
And uh, actually, we can see Polaris below the equator at times, which is also a geometric impossibility on the globe. And this is where Occam's razor will get thrown out again, and they'll start making excuses, uh, special pleading, post hoc rationalization, et cetera. Flight times actually use GPS, which use a preferred direction. They make meridian corrections. So in the south, they use GPS to get the distances. They use they make meridian corrections, actually subtracting distances over 69 miles and accounting for the preferred direction of C. Actually, the variant nature of C. I hope we get into that, right, if that's what he specializes in. And then, of course, like I said, gravity is not mass attracting mass. That's archaic. So for the last minute and a half, I'm going to explain this. Most people that claim that the Earth's a globe that flies around the sun, they all bring up Newton, the mass attracting mass. You cannot believe in Newtonian mechanics and the heliocentric model at the same time. This is a fact because the Michelson-Morley experiment did not detect the orbit of the Earth. And if there's a force acting on the Earth that caused it to go into a circular motion, you would detect that circular motion with interferometry. That's what the Sagnac effect is. We did not detect the orbit. Einstein came in and saved the day by saying, oh, well, actually, the Earth is free-falling in a linear path in the curvature of space-time in a geodesic path. That's why you couldn't detect it, which means... Quite literally, either you pick Newtonian mechanics or the Earth is orbiting around the sun. You cannot have both. And in fact, if you do anything with orbital mechanics or aerospace engineering or anything like that, they use Newtonian mechanics. So if that were to even be true, which actually you treat it as an ellipse from our position, that would be evidence for a stationary Earth, quite literally, because if the Newtonian mechanics was true, the Earth cannot be orbiting around the sun. So it's very perplexing as to why people bring that up. Of course, also, it doesn't have a time variable. Gravity would have to be instant. You would have to have instantaneous action at a distance, just like Newton said. He didn't even propose a cause. He said it must be God doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, I know that, that was a lot. I try not to go too fast. We can get more into the specifics, but Occam's razor is, in the last 10 seconds, obviously that the Earth is a stationary topographical plane and that the Earth is in the center of the cosmos. Everything moves around us for all recorded history. You have to actually make tons of assumptions to explain how those are all illusions. Cool. Well timed, Witsit. Thank you very much, both of you, for your opening statements. Allow me to... Uh, just welcome our viewers at over 800 strong tonight. Thank you so much for hanging out with us.